for the first time you could see for a decent time my disclosure and uh, I have uh, absolutely nothing to disclose for this particular talk uh, because I will concentrate on stem cells and this is a big issue. It involves religion, politics, business and science. Let's see. For religion, it is all an embryonic problem. And as you know, in 1994, research with embryonic cells were considered by the church not necessary and even immoral. And that is because according to the church, life begins with the conception. I have clear ideas about that. If you go through something like this, and if you know that there is a neonate inside, you will go and try to save him. If you know that there is a tube with two cells, you will not do it. So to me, there is a big difference. Then uh, a lot of things have been said, and uh, it is quite funny that uh, despite the devil, everybody is uh, hoping to have uh, a good results, scientific, from the stem cells. Politics. Well, in 1995, the federal funds for stem cells research has declared illegal by Bill Clinton. George Bush, in 2006, emanated the law blocking the use of the embryonic cells. In 2009, Obama has removed that particular law. We do have a lot of political problem also in Italy, and I will not go into those. But also, and more importantly, stem cells is a problem in terms of business. Stem cells can provide a lot of money almost to everybody. It is not new that uh, it is quite active, the stem cells tourist uh, um, and there are many companies. I've been recently in Thailand, and you can have uh, an injection of stem cells for less than 500 euros. And uh, we might end up, if we do not regulate, to this particular situation. Therefore, we are talking about a complex issue without any rule, and that is what matter, in my opinion, but from the scientific point of view, we do have the possibility to reconstruct the human body and, of course, possibly the broken heart. And this is quite relevant. Let's see what we can say about stem cells in cardiology. The challenge is that the human heart could be a dynamic organ. We know that traditionally the Myocytes are post-mitotic cells, and the heart is a post-mitotic organ without the potential for self-renewal. That is what I've been told. Today, we are arguing that perhaps the heart is an organ capable of repair from endogenous and maybe also exogenous stem cells. This is all good, but the reality is that repair from endogenous stem cells, in my opinion, was discharged on the notion that after an infarct, the scan remains. There is no repair at all. And that has happened in thousands, if not millions, of patients. Nevertheless, in 2001, Orlik showed repair of infarcted myocardium after transplantation of bone marrow cells in mice. And look, the same year and only a week later, Strauer injects autologous bone marrow cells in a patient with infarct with um, a report an increase of the ejection fraction and the reduction of infarct size, only one week later. Then uh, 
the story about the stem cells starts and we started to know something more. For instance, and quite importantly, it was clear that the bone marrow has a, a very plastic capacity of producing different lineage of stem cells. The first one is the so-called hemopoietic stem cells. And this lineage can provide a cell like this, and neutrophils like this, and a platelet like this. I'm showing this to you because you can see the plasticity from the same line of stem cell. This was extremely important because the hemopoietic stem cells has the ability of reconstitute the hemopoietic system in a myeloablated host. And that is to me the only good therapeutic implication of stem cells in medicine and has a paramount importance for the bone marrow transplant. No question about this. Then there is another lineage. Oh, then the culture of stem cells started. And uh, when you read papers, you have all this definition, CD positive, CD54 positive, CK positive, uh, CD38 negative. Don't be worried. It means only whether the stem cells are expressing or not, outside or inside the membrane, several proteins which are named as you can see here. And so a sort of vocabulary has uh, uh, begun. Another lineage which is quite important is the one called mesenchymal stem cells. And uh, they have uh, a rather important plastic adherence. They are very well characterized and they can differentiate in chondroblast, osteoblast, adipocytes, and people think in all the free cardiac lineages. And so they can provide cells like this, bone like this, this is the hard bone, weak bone like this, adipocyte. Just have a look of the plasticity and maybe even the myocardium. And then uh, there is another lineage and that is the one which has interested cardiology more. It is uh, called the angioblast and uh, providing the production of endothelial progenitor cells, which has the ability to form endothelial cells which could be incorporated into the vessel. And that you can immediately imagine how important it could be for cardiology because always in ischemic heart disease we have a lack of oxygen, so if we can uh, allow more vessels to be constructed, maybe more oxygen can be brought to the myocyte. They are very well characterized and they have uh, a special capacity to form uh, a sort of a colony when they are in culture. So you can see them very easily and very well. And they can make a small capillary like this, which is allowing only one red blood cell to go at a the time. They are mobilized from the bone marrow to the peripheral circulation they are incorporated into site of injury and it seems that they have uh, a sort of cardiac homing, which means they try to go more where there is ischemia and necrosis. La mecca for cardiology. Several uh, papers came about to try to see what is happening after myocardial infarction. This is some work from us and you can see clearly that there is an increase of these cells after 10 days from the infant. And that has been confirmed almost by everywhere. So they are naturally increasing. Why not to further increase them into the possibly necrotic area? And so people started to isolate them from the bone marrow, expand in the laboratory, and eventually inject into the necrotic area, mainly by intracoronary injection. The first of the randomized trial, I'm not even mentioning the many trials which were not randomized. The first randomized trial was the Boots trial, and uh, the um, 
German colleagues uh, look at 32 controls and 32 injected uh, patients after a myocardial infarction. The endpoint was left ventricular ejection fraction, and uh, they reported that, that after six months, there was uh, an increase and a significant increase of the ejection fraction in the group which uh, was injected with the bone marrow cell. I'd like you to concentrate on two points of these slides, which is important. First of all, the initial ejection fraction is more than 50% in patients after an anterior myocardial infarction. Second, you can see that there was in the control group absolutely no recovery of ejection fraction. And usually, you know that there is a little bit of stunning. So that was strange. And therefore, our colleague decided to look what's happened after 18 months. And you can see that after 18 months, when you compare the ejection fraction 55 with 54, there was no longer any significant difference. So the thought is that this first randomized trial proves a sort of short-term safety. In my opinion, and I'm sure in the opinion of Professor Romeo, patients with myocardial infarction with preserved left ventricular function are not necessarily the candidates for stem cell transplantation. They just need a little of state-of-heart clinical care. Then uh, two other trials did uh, appear in the literature in the same number of the New England Journal of Medicine. I'm just telling you the, the most important papers. And the first one is called the ASTAMI trial, two central trial in Norway, and the patients randomized to receive bone marrow cells or the usual care. The cells were injected intra intracoronary six days after successful primary PCI, and the endpoint again was left ventricular function at six months, and that was done with the best of the technique. And these are the results. Look here, control group is this one, treated group is this one, no difference, no difference, no difference at all, uh, independently from which technique you use. So it was concluded that there is no effect of intracoronary administration of bone marrow cells on left ventricular function in patients with acute myocardial infarction. Same journal, same number, just different pages. Another trial was reported, the repair AMI. This is a multicentric trial, 200 patients from 18 centers. Intracoronary injection, again, between three and six days after successful primary PCI. The endpoint here was, again, improvement of left ventricular function at four months measured by angiography. And these are the results. You can see here the control group, and you can see here the treated group. And there was a statistical significance difference in favor of the treated group. Interestingly enough, this was more evidence in those patients which ejection fraction was lower from the beginning. So, and also, although it, this was a very small number of patients, when they look at uh, death, myocardial infarction, revascularization, and put it all <coughs> this together, these colleagues from Germany also found a rather good and significant effect. So they concluded that the intracoronary bone marrow cell administration is associated with the improved recovery of left ventricular function in patients with acute myocardial infarction. Also consider that these patients had uh, an anterior infarct and the uh, ejection fraction also was about 48%, suggesting to me that uh, all what is good is reperfusion but we will go on, on that. Then meta-analysis started to be produced, showing in general, when you put everything together, maybe a little bit of, uh, uh, of improvement. And uh, 
Today, we do have about 50 randomized studies, 2,600 patients showing very good safety, little, if any, efficacy, and these patients need, to me, little else than current state of art therapy. The targeted patients has not really been never used, and the target patients, to me, are those who are not candidate for <coughs> transplantation, who have an ejection fraction between 20%, where you cannot do anything else. These are the patients that perhaps should be addressed. The poor outcome could be attributed to different stem cell preparation, timing and mode of administration, choice of the endpoint, characteristic of the patients, and once again, now people are more concentrated in patients with severe heart failure, choice of stem cells. The future of mesenchymal, the future could be the mesenchymal cells. People said we have been using the wrong one. And that is because they are easy to isolate, they have very high reproducibility, and several clinical studies are going on. We have been interested also in the mesenchymal stem cells. I make a long story, very short, and first of all, because we were interested to use them in patients with severe heart failure, we did look what is happening to these cells during heart failure, and you can see that there is a very progressive increase in heart failure according to the severity of heart failure. In class four, quite a lot of these mesenchymal cells are circulating. However, when we decided to isolate them from uh, the adipose tissue, either of volunteers or patients with heart failure, in order to expand them and then re-inject, you can see just the yield, I'm not even talking about the functionality, but just the, the yield, the quantity of stem cells that you can recover, you can see that if uh, volunteers, that is 100%. But look, in patients with severe heart failure, those who need them, you can, at the best, isolate the 40% of them, and believe me, they are not functioning at all, suggesting that the disease itself has caused something to these cells. Therefore, to me, they will be not able to be used in the clinic. And it is always very good to look deeper because you may have the perception that these two individuals are giving a talk, more or less the same stature, but when you look a little bit closer, you can see that there is something wrong in one of the two. The evolution of stem cell studies, so started with 2001, and we are 10 years after now, and there is a new momentum. And this new momentum is quite important because the evidence of apoptosis in the heart is a sort of prerequisite for regeneration. People, when they agree that the failing heart shows sign of apoptosis, people thought that for some reason or another, some regeneration should be possible. In other words, the life and death cycle of the myocyte could be reinstated. And the second uh, new concept is uh, that these stem cells can have a paracrine action. And the first concept is also uh, uh, somehow putting into at least consideration the fact that the heart itself could contain some stem cells. And uh, these uh, two clinical trials, which are still ongoing, have, uh, in my opinion, put in the second challenge in cardiology. And this is to consider the heart no longer a post-mitotic organ, but an organ that is able to reproduce. This is because it has been shown, and I go very quickly, perhaps here you can see even better, 
that in the heart, indeed, there are some stem cells, here you can see labeled in blue, which are there, are resident there, and they could be somehow uh, uh, isolated and reconstituted in the laboratory, or at least stimulated to grow. That has been uh, done by uh, a group of colleagues in the States, and this is the first trial which used endogenous stem cells. And the first pilot data are very positive. So the change is that uh, people are now going from exogenous to the endogenous stem cells, and that has been following the early data of uh, Anversa and his colleagues. Data which I have to say has also been rather strongly questioned. Now, Scipio. Scipio is a trial, and what they did, they take patients during bypass uh, heart operation, they isolated the right atrial appendix, and they harvested the uh, cardiological stem cells and they expanded them. And then they injected intracoronary at a mean of 100,000, 100 uh, uh, days after surgery. So that is good because there is no question about standing and so on. And the number of cells and site of administration was proportional to the size of infarct. So I should say a very well designed uh, uh, clinical trial. And uh, once again, you can see that uh, in the controls, uh, you can see that there are very few patients, but in the controls, there is no changes in ejection fraction, and you should not expect here, because they are at 100 days after bypass, and you can see that there was a very clear increase of the ejection fraction in the treated group. And uh, also, this seems to remain at uh, 12 months. And uh, this is the changes that you have at 12 months. So positive data, very few patients. Let me nasty a little bit, and this is what the community thinks, a little bit too good to be true. Then there was another uh, trial, that is the CADECUS trials. And uh, here, more or less, they did uh, exactly the same, uh, the same uh, uh, protocol, but the stem cells were protected and put it into some uh, cardiosphere. And they've been injected. And uh, the colleague have been looking for the scar and uh, for the viable uh, myocardium. And you can see the controls are in blue, and you can see that there is uh, some scar formation, and there is significantly some scar formation at uh, six months, no more scar at uh, 12 months, and significantly lower scar in the treated group, and significantly higher and more viable myocyte in the treated group. So, good results. But you can see that there was absolutely no improvement of the function of the heart, despite this uh, hypothetic good results. So, ladies and gentlemen, here where we are. And I think that uh, it is important to remind, particularly to the young who are uh, getting into pneumology and cardiology, that medicine is not magic and the doctors are not magicians. <coughs> it was, in my opinion, too easy to say we take a piece of bone marrow, we inject it, and all these cells will become myocyte and we start to contract again. And I like to remind you that to make a drug, we need years of very well regulated research and huge financial investments. The stem cell research has been no regulated or even down regulated, has been very individual and uh, hasty. And uh, I like also to conclude that perhaps there were too many hopes. And I like to use this uh, image. I'm sure that you will agree that these two lines are parallel and uh, absolutely equal. Now look 
what is happening to these two lines if I put in a perspective. And the perspective is a railway. You immediately imagine that this line is bigger than this. In fact, they are exactly the same. But with the stem cells, we have been put it into the perspective which lasted only 10 years that we could solve all the cardiological problem. And that was bad. Was bad because the idea, in my opinion, is great. But the scientists had to work much more than one week after the first injection in animals. And we need to know exactly the pathophysiology. We need to know much, much more before starting into the clinic. And uh, has gone to the clinic was, in my opinion, a huge mistake because has frozen a possible very good area. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Right, please. <clears throat> Thank you, Roberto, for this uh, really excellent presentation. It's very equilibrated as uh, your personality. <laughs> so, not too many ops because uh, it's very dangerous to give uh, too many ops in this field. I think that... Uh, we, there is one question. Uh, yes, we can discuss each presentation. Thank you, Roberto. Fascinating presentation. Is, is there a, the alternative approach to stimulate progenitor cells within the myocardium? <coughs> this is, uh, uh, yes, this is the other approach which uh, mm, at the moment has not been tried. Uh, we do not know by which stimulus we could uh, uh, do that. I have to tell you that uh, we in Ferrara were perhaps the first to use Figastrin, a FEG uh, promoter. Uh, Figastrin is used by the oncologist in order to increase, you know, during sites of... Uh, chemotherapy, we found that the injection of figastin, we did inject it in uh, uh, human beings uh, after myocardial infarction, was safe. Uh, it did increase enormously the amount of angiogenic stem cells. At that time, we measured only the angiogenic one. But unfortunately, there was absolutely no effect in terms of uh, left ventricular function recovery. So the idea uh, of uh, uh, stimulating the stem cells is good. We have also to consider that particularly after an acute myocardial infarction, these stem cells, even if they are there, they will be in a milieu of death. Uh, there will be a lot of stimulus for apoptosis, and therefore, in my opinion, they have a, a big chance to die. That is why I do not necessarily believe that this way will be good. The first results are good, but always the first results are good. Also, it is quite important to, to stress the fact that it is very difficult to publish negative data, uh, particularly with the stem cells. And there are a lot of negative data around that are not uh, necessarily known. Many, many, many... Uh, <coughs> groups that have been in contact with uh, tried to use them and uh, they, they didn't find any, in, any good results. Other question? If, if, oh. no, no, please, ah, please. No, no, I was saying if not, I have to apologize yes. with the chairman and with the speakers. <laughs> But I have to go for the European Society of Cardiology in Mexico, and uh, I hope to bring back a very good news for Italy. Okay. okay. Thank you. We are Thank sorry. you very much. <laughs> Thank you.